I guess it could be quite uh, controversial because I'm going to say that the opposite view of the previous term. So at least we'll be able to make a combined
which means that you may have a correct program, add a new thread to this correct program, and this new program is incorrect because you have introduced some new computation that is not compatible with the former one. So to write a correct program with threads requires a global understanding of the program, and this is always very difficult. So the problem of all of this is that actually when you program with threads, you have quite a loose semantics when you add a semantics. That is, maybe the thread add a semantics, but in general, the scheduler has no semantics. That is, in general, the behavior of the scheduler is left unspecified. In some cases, such as in Java, it's even worse, because in Java, it is specified that the scheduler has an unspecified behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is one problem, the scheduler. And then, even though some functions of the API have very strange semantics, for instance, if you think of Podix1, the join operator of Podix1 is not deterministic, because if several threads are waiting for the termination of just one thread, one will get the value of the execution of the thread that is terminated, but not all the threads that are waiting for the termination. Which one? You don't know. It's not deterministic. So this is an example with Codex 1. With Java, we do have some problem, which is that from version to version, the API becomes, uh, how can I say, poorer and poorer. There is some function <laughs> For instance, in the new version, you don't have destroy, and you don't have suspend. And the reason why you don't have this function is because in the Java model, you cannot give a semantics for this function. So that's why they get rid of this function. <laughs> so, I will try now, if you are not convinced yet that programming with thread is extremely difficult, I will try to convince you with a small graphical example. So, in our game, we will try to draw a circle. That is, we will have a graphical object, which will be a ball, which will be shared by several threads. And we will make this small ball move with two threads, one following the cosine path and one following the sine path. And when you execute in parallel of the cosine and the sine, you would like to draw a circle. So we will try to write this in Java. So here is the very beginning of our implementation. This is a shared object. It has two methods, <coughs> sine and cosine. So it's really a stupid implementation. Then we have our two threads. The first one is on the cosine. And as you can see, it's just a loop that runs forever which just follow, it, it just call the cosine path, the cosine method of the, of the ball instance. And then in our main program, we run in parallel the sine and the cosine. So now the question is, maybe you are experts in thread programming, so the question is, what will we get with such an application? So we have our application, which is here. I run it, and guess what will we get? We don't get the sun, but we get the square. It's quite a mess. Why do we get the square? So, we get the square because actually our two threads do not cooperate. And because the scheduler switches from one thread to the other at just arbitrary moments. And what happens actually is that our scheduler, which is right here, the Java scheduler, tends to allocate the processor to the thread that is consuming the processor. So it means that actually you are just calling cosine, you are invoking the thread cosine, and when the scheduler really elects a new thread, it really elects cosine. So we draw horizontal lines, which are cosine, and at some point, we don't know when, we don't know why, the scheduler decides, well, it's enough for cosine, let's go to sine. <laughs> so draw vertical lines. And at the end, you get the square. So, the question is that, since right now we are still stupid problem with threads, we may wonder, okay, what do I have to do in order to draw my circle? In the first code, I was just lacking synchronization. I was lacking cooperation. So I will introduce cooperation. That is, here, I will introduce an explicit cooperation. I will get the processor. So with this second version, what will I get? I am just waiting for my Java application. So, what do I get? I get another square, but a different one. <laughs> a different one. <laughs> so, why do I have this? Well, this time the two threads do cooperate. 
But you know the scheduler still has a total freedom to select next, the next way to be to, to be elected for the CPU. And in particular, when you say yellow, it's just a hint that is maybe the scheduler will select you again at the next time. So we are several times, cosine which is executing, and later on it will be signed. So we will try to trick the scheduler. We are doing that. What we can do? We can say, I want to yell the processor, I will sleep. This, this way, I want the next one re elected because I will have to sleep for a certain amount of time. So instead of yell, I use sleep over there. So the question now is with this third version, what do I get? Well, I have something that at the very beginning looks like a circle, but it's a strange one because from time to time you see this line is thick and sometimes it's thin and it's not a perfect circle, it's some kind of a non-deterministic circle with some kind of irregularity. So if I wait long enough, actually I will end up with a square. So, <laughs> 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 But you have no guarantee that you will be the next one to be executed when one millisecond has uh, been uh, executed. So, what you have to understand also is that for this small application, we are running a lot of threads. Our cosine, our cosine thread, our sine thread, but also a thread for the garbage collector, also a thread for the graphical user interface, and so on and so on. So, when you say, I want to sleep, you have no guarantee that will be awakened at the correct moment. Maybe the garbage collector will run in between a cosine and a sine. Maybe the sine will be executed twice. Well, you don't know. So, how do we have to program this circle? All good programmers with threads know that we have to enforce synchronization, that is, we have to share a lot, and we have to implement a strong synchronization, which is written and this code here. <coughs> we have synchronization here, we notify and we wait so what's interesting here is that with this implementation, actually we end up with the square, the circle is unique. But what's interesting here is that we have no concurrency anymore because we are using explicitly, we are executing explicitly sine, then cosine, then sine, then cosine, etc., etc. So this is the first remark. Then when I say that. One of the problems with threads is that synchronization is a global property. Imagine right now that I don't want to draw a circle, but I want to draw a figure eight, which is called a Lissajou curve. A Lissajou is obtained by running one sine and two cosines in parallel. So if I use my previous version that was just correct for running the thread, if I try to use it, <laughs> I get this. Because synchronization of three threads is totally different of the synchronization of two threads. That's what I mean by weak modularity. So, now you are really understood that I don't like thread and preemptive thread. <laughs> <laughs> so, we think that the problem is really coming from preemption. So, we think that in order to ease the task of the programmer, we propose a cooperative framework where we add a cooperative scheduler using a round robin algorithm, which is our scheduler will pick up the first thread, execute it, then the second one, then the third one, and it will restart the first one, etc., etc. So we have, we have a scheduler which is totally deterministic. We have an API which is totally deterministic, which means that we have a semantic support. Of course, when you want to program real application, at some point you need non-determinism. Because what you want to do is not deterministic at some point. For instance, when I want to get the file of the network, this operation is not deterministic because I have no way to, to estimate how long, to, how long it will take to get the file. This is not deterministic. So I need some construction that enables such programming in my system. And I will show you later on how do I program this non deterministic protocol. So the principle of our thread is. We have no preemption, which means that a thread has to yield the processor 
explicitly or implicitly. Implicitly because the square can be waiting for an event that is not present, so it is blocked until the event is present. Then we have events, and events is the only means for two threads to communicate. Of course, we have shared memory too, but events is the only way to, for two threads to communicate, and you broadcast events. That is, all the threads running in the, scan, in the same scheduler are able to see the event, and events is also all the value, so you can propagate values among the threads. Then we have this notion of instant, which is really at the earth of our scheduler. And an instant is some kind of a time boundary. And more precisely, an instant ends when all the threads running in the scheduler are blocked, either because they are just waiting for an event or because they are explicitly yelled the protocol. So when such a condition is met, the instant is ended, and we switch to the next instance, that is, we array all the events that have been broadcast and go to the next event. So I will just detail a little bit this notion of instance, just in order to be sure that you understand our model. So we are we have three threads that we could be running in parallel in our system. Since we are using a simple rubbing algorithm, we select the first thread to be the first one to get the CPU. So the first instruction, so we well, really don't see it over there. So we start executing this. We are using a red color, and I'm using red color for this example, so we don't need this much. So at the very beginning, we start with this instruction await event 1. Since event 1 has not been broadcast during the instance, this thread gets blocked, and the scheduler selects the next one to do that. So the scheduler selects this thread. This thread broadcasts event 1. The thread is not blocked, so it keeps executing, and it reaches the output instruction with explicit. So this means that this thread has completed from the instance. So the scheduler selects the next one, which is the way event one. The next one has been broadcast over there. So this instruction succeeds, and this, this thread executes this instruction. This instruction broadcasts event two. Then it waits event three, which is not present, which has not been broadcast. So this thread occurs. We have executed all the threads, but there is one thread, which is thread A, that is waiting for an event that has been broadcast to the instance. So the instance is not every day. You still have to execute thread A. So we start executing this instruction. At this point, event 1 is present, so we go over there. Event 2 is present, it has been broadcast here by thread C to the instance. So this instruction does not block. We go here, and this thread explicitly yells the processor. So at this point, this thread is blocked, this one is blocked, and this one is blocked waiting for it. So everybody is blocked. This one is ending. We erase all the events, and we start executing the next instance, which means we pick up the next instruction of thread A, and we start with So this is the way we program the instance. And the execution here, the that are just summarized by this presentation. So, now that I'm done with the general principle of the thread, I will just now focus on how we have implemented this in scheme, and I will just illustrate this by a couple of examples. So, before just detailing some function of the API, the principle of programming with this kind of thread. The first thing you have to do is to create one of several schedulers. We may have next scheduler. So you create a scheduler, then you create a thread. <coughs> and as in Java, there is a distinction between creating a thread and running a thread. You, run, you create a thread in a first time, <coughs> and in a second time, you run it in a scheduler. Then you proceed to scheduler reaction, that is, you execute the instance of the scheduler. So, just a few words of API in order to enable you to understand the, the example that I will be presenting afterwards. We can create a scheduler. We can create a scheduler. We have a current scheduler, which is the scheduler I get into the thread. We have a create case. Then we have this function that just executes one instance of the scheduler. This one executes one instance, and if there is still a running thread in the system, it automatically executes the next instance until all threads are completed. And then we have this function that 
used, that is used broadcast even to all the thread running in Australia. I will show you how to use this picture after one. Then we have some function running on thread. The first one creates a thread. It takes our argument at back, which is a lambda abstraction with no parameter. Then we have a predicate, we have a current running thread. This function starts a thread into a pillar. So it is a notional argument, which means that we have a notional argument for pre-existing pillar. <coughs> then this function thread split, makes a current split, makes a current thread split for a certain amount of time. And when I say that the API is deterministic, here this time is measured in numbers of instants. So when you say I want to split three instants, it's exactly three instants. It's not two, it's not four, it's exactly three. Then I add the yield operator, which is basically yield processor. I add this join, this join function that wait for the termination of the thread. I add suspend resume terminate. I just present them because, as I have said, they have been removed in Java. So now how to program with event. The first function broadcast just broadcasts an event instantly to all the thread running in the scheduler. The second function awaits an event. The third one is an interesting one because it returns all the value associated to an event during an instant. So in order to get all the value broadcast during an instant, we actually last exactly one instant. So the effect of this function is to block the thread for the instant. And at the next instant, it returns a list of value associated, associated with the event. I will show you an example of this. Now, this function, I have said at some point we need non-determinism. And non-determinism is introduced by this function. What all these functions do is they create a kind of fake event that can be used by any thread to wait a specific event. And in addition, what they do is that they run in background the process or a certain thread or you don't want to know what, that we automatically broadcast this fake event when a certain condition could be met. I will show you this in this example. This first example, this thread is blocked until the event 2 is broadcast. On this second example, this thread is blocked until this background process has been able to read a thousand characters on the input part. So you see, we have this kind of background process. So this thread, when it's blocked, waiting for the character to be read, is not blocking the other thread running the system. So, here we have really a The second form, white, uh, sorry, block the current thread until the pattern here is read on the input form P. And at that, this form block the current thread until the connection is established in this way. So, now we know enough in order to implement an HTTP server supporting multiple requests and uh, serving multiple files simultaneously. So, the implementation of the HTTP server. The first thing is that this function just starts the scheduler, which is create a thread just implementing the HTTP server. We start it in the current scheduler and we proceed to all the, we execute all the instances of the scheduler, which means that this function returns when the HTTP server is done. Now, this is the value of the HTTP server. This is a loop over there. We duplicate the socket, which is listed as a parameter. We block the current thread until the connection is established with this socket. When such a connection is established, we create a new thread that will handle the request. We run it in the scheduler in the start. We yield the processor, and we leave on the next. So really, have in mind that when the thread is waiting for a connection to this socket, many other threads are running. So, now, what about the request? How do we handle the request? When you have, when you have a request in HTTP, the first thing you have to do is to decode the request in order to find out which file is reserved. This is done here. As soon as you have the file, you open the input port and you call this function. This function is just a loop, and you say, okay, I will read all the characters of the file to be served one thousand at a time, which means that each time I will read this buffer of character, this thread will get blocked, but maybe other thread will be running in the system. And in particular, the 
still am here and I'm still. Then you say, okay, I will go for this step. And I will, as a next instance, I will call this function for all the values <coughs> associated with the event here. And once this function does, it actually compares the number of the broadcasting count itself, which is the same with nothing. If the number is a multiple, actually this number changes direction to go toward the multiple, and otherwise to nothing. And this is it. So, the last example, we have balls. So here I have the hundred ball. Each ball is a thread. And what this application does is that actually when I introduce a new ball, each time it overlaps with the ball, it contaminates the, the ball it is overlapping. So when my balls are red right now, then they will become green, well, which is red, yellow, and so on and so on. So how do I implement this? I will show you this. So this is it. Now for this particular program, we are using a property that is <coughs> an event. It's not necessarily a symbol or a string. It can be any arbitrary thing value. So here, an event is a pair of two integers which just denote the position of the ball, of the ball which is broadcast in the So this is the body of the thread. We move according to the direction. We create this event which is just created there. And then we broadcast this event with a value which is constant. And then we call this function for all the events that are broadcast during the event. And what this function does is that it's just all this function. This function just compares A1 and A2. If A2 is older than A1, A2 gets contaminated. So now what is interesting here is that in the previous example, I was broadcasting music here, and everybody was receiving music here. So we have a nice way of fixing it. Right now, we are just broadcasting for the position where we are at, which means that somebody that is not at the same position that has received the event. So with this, we are reducing the complexity of our application. So now, when I said I'm deterministic, I'm referring to a semantic. And this is the semantic, the denotation of the semantic of our thread. Of course, this slide is a kind of joke because I don't expect you to understand this semantic. I don't even expect you to be able to read it. It's just in order to show you that we have this, and this is not a paper, so you can read it, but we have this, and we are able with this semantic to reason about the interaction and in between thread and scheme, for instance, the interaction in between thread and policy and stuff like that. So, one more time, when I said it's deterministic, that means that I have a semantic, I'm able to predict what will be the repression of the program using it. So, in conclusion, we have added this thread system using cooperative thread. It supports for cooperative and concurrent I.O. operation, which means that we have cooperative thread, but when one thread is waiting for an I.O., it does not block the other thread running in the system. It's, well, in Steam, we have this, what we call SURF-T, which is Steam Request for Implementation, which is a way for our user to extend the language. And there is one surf specifying an API for thread. And actually, our implementation is totally compliant with this surf because we are just using the very same API. And uh, at last, in conclusion, it is available at this HTTP address. And I will just conclude with a last demonstration, which looks like the one of the prime numbers. But for this last demonstration, we have words that are just trying to escape one bad word that try just to eat the other one.
threads don't want to have to think about are they running, who's running. I mean, and as an application developer, which is all I am, you know, I love simplicity. And what you had there was required the programmer to mark code and synchronize the, the threads and, and to be thinking about that while they develop the threads. And for the certain application, it was great. I mean, I can see the events. Like the numbers, key, but yeah, who got there first? Yeah, okay, so the first thing is that maybe I'm not being clear enough for, for this. I think that our proposal, our proposal is not general. I mean, we are just focusing on, on certain kind of application. That's that fine. Then to come, by, to come back to your remark, as soon as you have preemption and shared memory, that you are using shared memory, you need synchronization. So as soon as you are using shared memory, you need to take care of what, who is doing what. And for instance, if you want to implement an HTTP server with a regular preemptive model, as soon as you introduce a cache for time, you will have to introduce preemption. You will have to introduce synchronization. And so you will have to take care of who is doing what. So that's true that my, my example was unfair because it was just exaggerating something. But however, when you have to implement synchronization, it's a difficult task. And it's always and well, it is, and if you are not using shared memory, you are not using thread, you are using process, like that. So, I agree with you, but I don't. 